am going to be pushing certain things in today's episode, really pushing in on a couple points because I want you to be successful. And I have heard you, and it is winter time, and y'all have been struggling with getting your bread to prove you've been getting it, you've been having troubles getting it to raise upright. Honey, I want to help get you over those problems. This is an amazing recipe that I developed just for you guys. And I'm going to show you how to do it a little bit different than I have in the past. So guess what? I'm going to be varying from the written directions of the original recipe. And why am I doing that? I'm doing that because it's so much easier to learn one thing at a time. When you learn one skill, it's so much easier than trying to learn 10 different skills. My recipes are developed so that you can learn the base skills that are needed and required for being successful in baking breads at home. Then, when you have built that success, it gives you motivation to keep going. And at that point, you've then learned and started to actually develop the technical steps that go into making bread, which allows you to then be able to progress. So I am showing you different ways that you can use the exact same method, the exact same recipe to make different flavors of bread, different types of bread. That's what I do. I'm not teaching you all oh, 10, 20, 100 different breads. I'm teaching you the exact same bread. We're just making it a little bit different. And my dear, that is a beautiful thing to be able to know that you can do because if you have someone that comes over with allergies or you have some picky eaters in your home, or maybe there is a conflict between yourself and your own family of what type of breads you are putting on the table, whether they like all white and you like whole wheat because you want to help your diet or vice versa, these recipes are designed so that you can find that happy middle ground where everyone can be helped, happy. It is a wonderful thing to be able to fall back on. And I am showing you exactly how to do that. We're not only learning the basic skills, we're not only learning how to be successful and confident in our baking, but you're also learning how that you can take full control over the breads that you're pulling out of your oven. All right, my dears, I'm just ready to make some delicious honey oatmeal whole wheat bread. It's January is National Whole Wheat Bread Month, guys. So you know what? For this month's bread tutorial, we are making up some delicious honey oatmeal whole wheat bread. So you want to grab the recipe save download version. I'll be posting it down in the description a link where you can go and grab the printable and saveable version so that you can throw it in your cookbook and keep it up, uh, grab it anytime that you want to. All right, so you need molasses, honey, yeast, salt, flour, oatmeal. Now you need two types of flour, y'all. You need whole wheat and you also need some all-purpose unbleached. Always buy unbleached. Yes, I know bleached has a finer grind to it, but you don't want all that chemical in your diet, y'all. All right, and you're also going to need some lard. Now, if you're not a lard user, yes, you can use shortening. To be honest, the best flavor between lard versus shortening, lard, hands down. It has this very rich, beautiful, natural flavor to it. Without further ado, let's dive in and start making some bread. We are starting with some warm water. Now, I teach country cooking which means I don't pull thermometers out. I honest to God, I don't even have a thermometer. So we're gonna pour a little down the back of our hand and if it is hot, when it hits your hand, that very moment of hitting your hand, it's hot, it's too hot. Your water should feel like the equivalent of a good hot bath. Or if you've got little kids and you have bottles, it's that same temperature that you're reaching for where it is almost hot on the back of your hand for just a split second, but it's totally comfortable like it it's just it's really really nice and warm but not burning so the ideal temperature is 120 to 130 
I am going to be pushing certain things in today's episode, really pushing in on a couple points because I want you to be successful. And I have heard you, and it is winter time, and y'all have been struggling with getting your bread to prove you've been getting it, you've been having troubles getting it to raise upright. Honey, I want to help get you over those problems, okay? So, you want your water right now, or the middle of January, when it is cold and it's snowing and it's blowing outside. You want your water between 120 to 130 degrees. If you are going to be using water that is barely 100 degrees, you're going to have a harder time getting your bread to raise up. This is important. This is important because yeast likes warmth. Yeast is very touchy on the temperatures that it works at. Now, the low end of yeast actually turning on is somewhere around 95 degrees. And if you're going to be lucky to get it to really activate at 95 degrees, okay? 90, 95 degrees Fahrenheit. But if you get it too hot, so if you're over 130, you start running the risks of actually killing your yeast. When it is snowing, cold, and blow outside, blowing outside, you need to turn that temp up towards that higher end. So you want to be getting as close to 130 as possible without going over. This is going to help make sure that your bread is actually going to raise. All right, beautiful temp. So we need to start with one, just one cup of our water to begin with. Okay. So, set that there. Now we're gonna get our yeast out. So we need one to two tablespoons of yeast on this. I have a variance on the yeast that I add to these because I live in the Rocky Mountains. In the Rocky Mountain range, the weather is unpredictable and it's always changing. Middle of summer and it might be snowing outside. Middle of winter and we might have green grass like popping up, okay? So the colder it is, you wanna add a little bit more yeast if you wanna keep your bread on the same time frame. Now, if you don't have a problem with your bread taking long to raise, you can go with the lower yeast content. And that is amazing because when you can go with the lower temp, the lower amounts of yeast, it's actually better for your gut because yeast creates gas. And if you have too much of it in your diet, it starts causing belly problems. So I like to keep on the lower end, but in the winter time, we're just gonna let it go. So I will be adding two tablespoons because it is cold out here and it does affect how quickly your bread will raise. And the length of how long it takes you to raise your bread is also gonna change how your bread tastes. All right, so we've got our yeast in here with one cup of water. We are now going to add one tablespoon of molasses. And this is just a rough amount. So you wanna keep it just below the rim of your spoon and try to keep that bubble just below the rim. Okay, now we need three tablespoons of honey. This equals two, y'all. And one. So there's a lot of sugar in this bread. Now, yes, you can technically cut the honey out. You can technically take the molasses out of this bread, too, if you are on a sugar, uh, a low sugar diet. But if you want your bread to taste just like grandma's bread used to, make sure you add that molasses and at least a touch of honey. What we're going to do is just give this a very, very quick mix. Set it to the side. And let's start getting our dry ingredients, our first initial dry ingredients, in here and start clearing our board. We need one cup of oatmeal. In total, we need four cups of whole wheat. Now we're just going to do this speed process while we're, so we're not going to be tapping and giving accurate measurements. Bread is beautiful like that because you can get away with it, honey. Three. And we are going to be putting all four cups in from the get-go. We need four tablespoons of lard or your baking fat. Two tablespoons. And 
Once again, these measurements do not actually have to be exact. It's just a close roundabout. Red is very forgiving. And I want to stress that because I know a lot of you have had a lot of problems with your bread baking and your... So some of you have mentioned that, you know, you're, you're just not getting your measurements accurate enough. You don't have to have accurate measurements to make bread, honey. It's the process of how you work your dough, how long you let it rest, how long you, uh, the temperatures that it's exposed to, that dictates whether or not your bread is going to be successful. Whether it's going to raise or whether it's never raising and you throw it in the oven because you finally are just done with it or it just never bakes. And that's what we call the dreaded brick bread. Now, my dear, as I've told you in earlier vid videos, I specially developed these recipes, these fail-proof recipes, for you. I've listened to everything going on, and I don't want you to ever come back and say that you pull brick bread out of your oven again. Because, honey, I'm telling you the exact ways so that you can avoid that. All right, so we've got that mixed in. We're going to keep our white flour here, or our all-purpose flour. Give ourselves just the tiniest touch of room. Our lard is mixed in. Look how fast that raised up, y'all. This is a like the biggest key to making your bread. Start your yeast first, because in times like winter time, you need to make sure that yeast is very, very wide awake and active. Give it plenty of sugars so that it can grow. Okay, sugar feeds your yeast. All right, pour that in. Just a tiny little scraping. Now, all right, nice goopy spoon. Okay, so let's add our remaining water. We need a total of two and a half cups, so we need one and a half. I can't see my measurements on this cup. One and a half right there. Now, it's okay if this water's a little warmer this time around than it is in the very beginning when you're first waking this up. So. Clean our handle up just a tiny bit. All right, we're going to give this a quick mix. So where we've got all four cups of whole wheat flour in here, along with our oatmeal, this is going to be a slightly thicker pre-proofing than what I usually teach you to do. We're going to set this aside for five minutes. And during that time, we're going to go ahead and put away all these things that we've already put in. So if this is the first time we've met, my name is Crystal Imason with Mill Artistry, where we teach you and help you to style your life style because there's so much more that goes into who you are than just one thing right so we make unique one-of-a-kind jewelry home goods is returning so our furniture and decor will be coming out later this year and we also take you back in time by teaching you the old pioneer secret methods to being successful in baking homemade breads so that you my dear can walk away from buying store-bought breads and honestly, let's, say, let, let's face the facts. With the rising cost of everything and the call for food shortages coming up. <gasps> oh, yeah, having these old secret methods and the know-how to do this is going to be so important. And frankly, right now, just to cut the costs of your grocery bill. Yeah, that right there all by itself makes it totally, totally worth it. So if you want to really be able to step up your game in bread baking, or you know somebody that would like to, that just happens to be a busy parent and wants to take back control of their own life and the foods they're eating and how they're interacting with their family and being active in the kitchen, all those good things all combined into one, guess what? Home by Breads with Busy Parent Course is about to reopen its doors for enrollment, and I'm so excited. The final date is in the book. The last day of January, doors are opening for Homemade Breads with a Busy Parent Course, where I will teach you one recipe and teach you how to turn that single recipe into eight different breads 
that you can make as white, half wheat, whole wheat, and all the goodies. Okay, this is an amazing course, and I truly invite you to bring your children into the kitchen with you to learn side by side with you, and I'll show you how to do that. So if you want to start being more successful in the kitchen, be able to have the time in your life in order to bake the breads that you need to make, honey, stick with me. And if you want to know more about it, I will include the links down below where you can get on the waiting list. And I highly suggest getting on the waiting list because you don't want to miss out on this. I release this course once every year. And I just got done doing a full re-record of it where I just amped up the energy and made it all that much better for you. So let's get back to our bread. So if you notice here on the counter, we still have our salt sitting here. Do not add your salt until after this initial burst pre-proofing because salt can actually kill your yeast. So we need half of a tablespoon of salt. You need to have salt in your bread to pre preserve the flavor of that fresh, beautiful, fresh out of the oven flavor from, yeah, it's delicious, but too much salt. Salty bread isn't good. You need that happy in between. Do not forget to add your salt. Unsalted bread is horrible. Been there, done that many times, especially when I went on a low sodium diet. Oh, don't make your bread without salt. You've got to have a little bit in there. Now, we're going to start adding our flour. Now, just for the purpose of and then keeping I mean, a little accurate to our measurements, I am going to go ahead and start scraping these off. In total, we are going to need one to two cups of flour. Now, we're just going to mix this up really fast. Now, before we go any further, if you have any jewelry on your hands, remove it. All right, my dears, we are going to knead this dough for the next 10 minutes. Now, in some climates, you can get away with kneading this for about eight minutes. But if you're having a problem with your dough raising, knead it for 10 minutes or until it starts ripping. When you see that rip, that tells you that your dough is done. All right, that means those glucoses have been released from your breads. So dough turns, it's, it has a turning point where it goes from being super, super soft underneath your hands to where all of a sudden it starts getting a little bit stiff, a little more springy. It's a little harder to push down through it. That is when your dough is actually done and you've done the job of releasing all the glucose is required from the wheat itself in order for your yeast to do its job and make your dough raise. Okay, I'm, I'm pulling out all the stops. I'm giving you all the secrets today, y'all. So, work this dough. For 10 minutes, especially if you live in the high country and in snow life, such as I do up here in the Rocky Mountains in Wyoming. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Work your dough, honey. Kneading is important. All right, this dough has actually turned, but I'm going to show you what it looks like just a little bit past this so that you know for sure when your dough is actually finished kneading. So right now, this dough is starting to get stiff underneath my hands. And if you notice, it's got this nice, smooth, smooth top. It has a different look to it, a different texture to it. This dough is done. But if you're not sure when your dough is done yet, especially if you're new to making bread, knead it until it rips. And let me show you what that looks like. Right there. Right there. Do you see that big old rip that just formed while I was pushing it down? See, it's nice and smooth. It pulls really beautiful. 
when your dough turns, this is what it's going to look like. And if you push it just a little bit past that, then it's going to rip. And it'll be little rips all over the place or big giant rips. So we're going to stop right there. Okay, so we're going to form this into a bow. Okay, so now we're going to add a little bit of vegetable oil. I like to use vegetable oil for this step. It's just easier to work with. But you can also use water or your shortening. And we're just going to put a little bit of oil down here. Take our dough and throw it right in here. And we're going to roll it around in this oil. Now the ball is nice for rolling it because then it can get all the way around it. Okay, now because I've got little kids, mine is going to go sit in a proof setting in my oven so that I can keep it away from little fingers. All right, so if you need to put a cover on this, all you need to do is just put like a damp towel across it or some plastic wrap over the top of it. That's going to help retain that moisture if your oven puts heat off while it's in a proof setting. Now, if you don't have a proof setting, all you need to do, my dear, is kick your oven on for about maybe 60 seconds. And it doesn't matter what temperature you, you turn it on to because it takes time to warm the oven up. Now you don't want your oven hot, you're just warming it up. You're just taking the chill off of it. You want it a little bit warmer than what your house is. Especially if your house is cold because it's winter time. So I'm teaching you a slightly different method than what's in my recipe today, guys. So we're gonna let this proof for about 10 minutes today. Now I'm letting you inside my actual digital course today, all right? I'm taking you literally behind the scenes with this bag today. I want you to set this aside and let it proof for 10 minutes. And you are going to be amazed at the difference of the texture of the bread, doing it this way versus the way of the original recipe I'm sharing with you if you go grab that recipe. So if you haven't grabbed this recipe, make sure you go click the link down in the description to grab your free copy, download and print version of your own. Okay, we will see you in 10 minutes. All right, while our bread is raising, or doing its little mini proofing that we're doing on it, we need to grease our pans. A little bit of grease goes a long way. Do not be shy about greasing your pans, especially if they're not a conditioned pan. If you want to know about more about that, stay tuned because I am going to be doing some deep dive classes into all about conditioning and greasing your pans and why it's important and how it's going to save you so much time and misery in the kitchen baking your bread. So we need two pans, y'all. Yeah. Reason why our pioneer grandparents were so successful at baking their breads is because their pans were well used and conditioned and blackened. They were black with how much grease had been baked into that metal. Condition your pants, my love. All right, so our bread is has been proofed. Give it a good little shake. You can see how it's just instantly deflating. So we've got a good yeast starter in here and we've had the temperature at the right setting for our dough to raise up correctly. Knock it out. Thank you. 
All right, now we're going to just pop this into a proof setting in our oven once again or warm it on a nice warm place in your on your countertop. Now, if you live in high elevation, I told you I'm giving you all my secrets today, y'all. So if you live in high elevation and you proof this in your oven, I want you to add a small pan of boiling water. Now, this is true for either case. Always add a pan of boiling water to the very bottom of an oven safe pan. But if you proof this in your oven, do not open your door to your oven after it gets done proofing. So we are going to be setting a timer. This usually takes 15 to 20 minutes. So when you need to check on your dough, only turn the light on. Don't open your oven door. We are going to start baking this straight away in the oven. Get it up to temp in the oven when our dough is about one inch above our pan. Do not over raise this bread because it will fall and then you'll have a flat top bread. Still tastes delicious, but it will fall. Which is also why I'm telling you, don't open your oven door. Because if you do, you're going to affect the pressure inside your oven and it's gonna make it go. Same thing happens with your cupcakes and your cakes when you make them at home. If you open the oven after you put them in, if you open the oven ever after you put it in the oven, it's gonna fall and sink in the middle. Bread does the same thing, honey. So let's get this in the pre-proof ring and we are going to pre-proof this generally for 15, maybe 20 minutes, but you need to wait until it is just barely above the rim of the pan. So we want to start the bake. When this dough, any part of it, just above this pan. All right, my dear, after your dough has risen to an inch above the pan, then you're gonna kick your oven on to 400 degrees, leaving your dough inside. So if you're raising your bread on the counter, pop it in the oven and turn your oven on to 400 degrees with your little pan of hot boiling water on the very lowest part of your oven that you can put it on. And after your oven comes to temp, then you're gonna kick a timer on for 10 minutes, honey. And then you're going to, re after your 10 minutes is up, you're going to reduce your temperature to 380 and you're going to bake it for an additional 10 to 15 minutes. Then I'm going to show you how to start testing to see if your bread is actually done or not or if it needs to go back in for that last five minutes. Uh huh. Check it. That sound is the sound that you're going to be listening for, honey. Now, let's finish doing this. Do not leave your pan in the oven. Guaranteed, you will forget it's there, and you will burn your pan up later on. Oh, it smells so good. That is how a loaf of bread is supposed to come out of a pan, okay? If your bread doesn't come out like this, tune in for our upcoming videos on how to condition your pans, okay? Because that's how it's supposed to come out. It's not supposed to stick and glue itself to it. Now, now the top's got a good crunch, but this, it adds KV, adds KV. See how that just caves? It should not be that soft. So this is actually not done yet. No, it's still too soft. The top is good and hard. The bottom, the sides, they're not. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna put those back in the oven and give it five more minutes. Now, I did this on purpose for you guys because I have been listening to all the problems you guys have had. All right, why did that happen? Because I did not rearrange the racks in my oven. Did you happen to notice how high up in my oven my bread was sitting? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, the top is good and done. The bread itself is technically done, but we don't have that good hard crisp crust on the rest of the outside of the bread that is actually going to help preserve the bread in storage. That's why it's important. So we're gonna give it five more minutes. And if you guys are loving all of these additional 
behind the scenes tips and tricks and all the goodies packed into the video, make sure you let me know. Jump down in the comments, you let me know, and join the waiting list. I really want y'all to come join my waiting list. Oh, it's gonna be so much fun. Okay, we will see you in five minutes. Oh, look at that yummy bread. See, it's got a good hard crust all the way around, a good hollow sound. This is beautiful. Now, if I had not accidentally over raised this, like I told you not to do, which I did, this would not have sunk. So this particular baking method will fall if you over raise it, y'all. But this baking method is so much faster than your traditional breads. Your traditional breads take about four, three, four hours, depending on the type of bread you're making. This generally takes between an hour to an hour 30, depending on which way you decide to make this bread. The written directions will get you done closer to an hour. The directions I gave you in today's video, it's gonna take just a touch longer. All right, so here's the big reveal from how this bread turned out. Now, when I put this back in the oven, I put it on that bottom rack in my oven. This is a common mistake, okay? That was only five minutes, that's all it was. But you need to have your racks in the right spot in your oven to make your bread, okay? It's important. So if you have it way too high up in your oven, it's gonna cook the top a lot faster than it's gonna actually get down here. But if you like, oh crap, well, I don't want the top to cook any, like, any further, I just want that bottom to cook, this is what happens. I purposely did this for you guys, okay? Honey, if you are making large batches of bread, so that like your oven is packed full. Even if you have a convection oven, I do too, actually. I'll tell you what, I never use a convection setting on it though. That moving air current dries your bread out and it also seems to cook at a lower temperature because of that moving air. Now, I don't actually know. I never actually put an oven thermometer in my oven and compared it. It's something I should try though, just so that I can confirm the fact but a convection setting on my oven literally makes everything I cook with it take longer. And it dries everything out. So, you know, it just makes sense to me. But if you've got large batches in your oven, you need to rotate it multiple times in your oven all the way around. Remember, those outside edges of your oven are going to bake faster. Way up at the top is going to bake faster. Way down low at the bottom is going to bake faster. So if you put your up your bread accidentally way up on your top shelf and you pull it out and you're like, oh no, my sides aren't done yet. And then you're like, well, let's, let's we'll put it low in, in the oven. Don't do that. Put it in the middle of your oven because then you're going to have the bottom that was almost finished start burning before these sides ever get done. Okay? Yeah. So, honey, even burnt and now overcooked this bread is still delicious it is it's absolutely delicious and i'll tell you the best way i like to serve it put a little bit of fresh honey butter on it so good oh my gosh honey butter can solve any problem it can now i will tell you where this has been overcooked this bread is also going to be dry it's also going to be more dry because i didn't add the applesauce to this recipe we left the applesauce out the applesauce is beautiful. Unsweetened applesauce. Now, yes, this is, once again, it's adding more sugar to your bread. But it is a natural sugar, which helps just a little bit. It also helps add a little bit of fiber, a different type of fiber, into your bread. As well as the mix of the lard and the applesauce and all those gooey sugars from the honey and the molasses, especially the molasses is going to help moisturize your bread from the inside out. So if you are struggling with really dry bread, your bread just constantly drying out, let me let you in on the secret. I want you to swap half of the fats in your recipe, whatever recipe you're using. I've already done that in my recipes. I've pushed those fats back to their bare minimum and replaced them with applesauce, okay? The original version of making this bread calls for 10 
tablespoons of lard. Ten. That's a lot, okay? Ten tablespoons is over a half a cup of lard. Now, with me, I do have to be a little on the self, a little on the health conscious side. That is my own personal requirements. Like, I need that. That's not even uh, a choice for me. I have to have it. It's also one of the reasons why I started baking homemade breads in the first place. Because I reached a point in my life where I literally had to change my diet. And I was tired of not being able to eat anything. Everything I ate made me sick. So you know what? I started making homemade breads. I did have a very little background information. And I'm ashamed to say it. I grew up in a home where homemade bread was a normal thing. We made homemade rolls almost nightly together as a family. But you want to know what my only job was? I had one job that entire time. My job was to shape the dough. Was to shape those rolls. I never actually made the dough. I never actually baked it. All I did was cut a chunk off, roll it up, roll it in oil, put it on the pan, and the next one. I come from a very large family. So we all had our separate roles that we played when we were making bread. That was literally the extent of my knowledge of bread baking. And I was ashamed to go ask my family to say, hey, how do you do this? I was ashamed. I was, I was completely ashamed. And so that meant since I was too ashamed to ask for help, I had to figure it out the hard way by myself. And I did through trial and error and dedication to I just want to be able to eat something, anything, anything, and the food. I'm like starving, <laughs> give me food. And I wanted something that had taste. I was so tired of eating all the healthy options out there and being like, oh, this is a cardboard. And that was really the truth. But I learned through multiple failures, many, many mistakes, how to start doing this successful. And now I'm decoding it for you. And I'm showing you some of the very same mistakes that I made way back when. And I'm showing you why they're happening and how to fix them. Because you can't start being successful in baking your own homemade breads at home until you actually know why it's happened. Knowing why it's happening is the key to understanding how to fix it. Now, everyone's situation is going to be different depending on where you're living, what's going on in your own kitchen. Bread is a living thing that requires being connected to it, which is why I always teach handmade. I will occasionally pull out my mixing machine and I've showed you that in the past, but me, my passion lies in literally connecting with my bread because I like to connect with the living world. And bread is a living thing thing. You're literally creating it just like a child. You're forming it just like a child. You watch it grow just like a child and you watch it come to its prime when you pull it out of the oven as all grown up just like a child and then you get to enjoy all the benefits and the hard work of your labor that went into it. And you enjoy every tasty delicious bite. And you get to take full pride in the fact you are the one that did it, honey. You did it. No one else. My dear, told you I was giving you all my secrets today. So when this comes out, if it came out burnt like mine did, that happens. It happens. Even if you bake this correctly, it can happen. Ovens can be a fickle, fickle thing. Now, I may have done this on purpose for you today, but... This happens on a normal face. And I'll be completely honest, when I switch over to my second oven over here, I still haven't quite figured this oven out yet. It bakes different. It bakes like my camper oven. And if you're new to my channel, you haven't ever heard the stories of me baking in our camper when we lived in our RV trailer for over a year on the road in the back country all over the Western States. And the whole time I was making homemade breads, I ran into a lot of complications, not only because of the changed environment, but the changed in the actual type of flour I was using because I had switched from store-bought to fresh home ground. And I was then using my little itty bitty miniature 
camper oven. Burnt everything. Literally, everything was burnt. <laughs> there was no way around it. It just burnt. And it really did take me back to when... It, it kind of took me back in time. Your old time bread usually did come out burnt. Because there's always a hot spot in the oven. And there's no way to really avoid it. All you can do is just get in there and twist and turn the bread. But when two loaves fill your oven, literally to the max, all you can do is rotate them like this. <laughs> there's nothing else you can do. Which means your bread comes out burnt quite often because the bottom's way too hot in the oven. All right. When you get done pulling your bread out, here's this last step. I told you before, I'm going to tell you again. Store this in your cupboard. You can use any, any bread bag. Now, I don't actually suggest using the bags from the store. They're like a gallon bag, and it also will say store one gallon storage bag slash bread bag. They're too small. I'm going to tell you right now. They're too short. You can't actually seal your bread up with them. So wrap them up in saran wrap. If you've got extra, put it in your, your freezer and keep it for six months if you need to. Pull it out. And I will show you how to rehydrate that in future episodes coming out very, very soon. Store these in your cupboard, though. You can use old bread bags from bread that you bought at the store. I do this all the time. Or you can buy specialty big bags. I have those, too. You can also make your own bags using wax paper and a little bit of tape or, or a little bit of Mod Podge glue. It's beautiful. It seals in all of those goodies. Now, if your bread is burnt like mine, once it's been in a bag overnight, it's fully covered, it's actually going to soften it back up, okay? And that's a good thing. If it's really dry, you want it to soften up. You want it to. That way the bread melts and dissolves in your mouth instead of, you know, leave you dying for a drink of water because now your mouth's all dried out. Store this in your cupboard for three to four days. Now, the temperatures in your cupboards are going to affect how long it keeps. If you're not going to be able to eat your bread by the third day after you've made it, wrap it up extra tight and put it in your fridge. You can keep it in your fridge for up to around 10 days fresh from the oven. In your freezer, you can keep it for up to six months. And it's still going to be beautiful. But the best place to store your bread is in your bread, is in your actual cupboards. Okay? It doesn't have as long of a shelf life, but it will have the best taste. Bread absorbs flavors. The other thing is, when you put it in cold storage, like your fridge or in your deep freeze, it's actually going to dehydrate the wheat in your bread, which is going to make it very dry and crumbly. Stay tuned for future videos coming out on how to fix that. But does it mean that you can't do that? Absolutely not. I hope you enjoyed today's extra special baking tutorial. If you have questions, please drop them down in the comments below or reach out to me directly. So you can reach out directly to me either through messengers or you can send, shoot me an email, honey. Email me at crystalinison at milledartistry.com and I will get right back with you because I'm passionate and I'm dedicated to helping you find success in baking your own homemade breads just like I did all those years ago. So next week, as we dive into some actual bread coaching classes where I'm going to show you some of those things that I mentioned for you to keep watching for and listening for coming up in future episodes.